2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. If that represents you, if you know what that means, give the Lord thanks for the power and the joy of your salvation. You're saying right now, he's changed my life. Wouldn't be where I am without him. And here's what we know. It's not intended to stop with us. That what Jesus has done so powerfully in us is now to be a ministry from our story so that hundreds, even thousands of others will know this same joy and power of salvation. Church, today I want you to know there are people out there that need Jesus. I'm about to bring a message that I think if Jesus stood on this platform, uh, he just physically walked out here. I think he would say, I'm so thankful for all that the church provides for the family of God. But in all that happens for you within the church family, let us never forget those who still need to know, those who need salvation, those who need a church family, those who need real brothers and sisters in Christ, those who need freedom from addiction, those who need hope in their despair. And Jesus would stand here and say, you are plan A to get that message to them, and there is no plan B. So the change that has happened in us, we are now a catalyst for that to happen in other people. Say this with me, found people, find people. And if you believe it, give the Lord one more praise before you're seated. As you're seated, be reminded that when Jesus found Andrew, Andrew then went to Peter and said, you have to meet Jesus, and Peter became a follower. Continuing, Jesus found Philip, and Philip was so amazed at the power of Jesus that Philip went and found Nathaniel. Nathaniel had questions, and, and P Philip just said, just come and see, just come and see. And Nathaniel became a dynamic follower of Jesus because found people find people. You sang it today, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade, they are never enough. But you, Jesus, you came along. You put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. You found me, you saved me, you blessed me, you changed me. And now I've got to get that same incredible message of hope to other people, found people, find people. The message paraphrase sets up some incredible ways of thinking about being salt and light. When Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount and he came to this part about salt and light, he was literally by where they were gathered able to point to an area that was known as a salting center for where the fish were brought in. And everybody listening knew about the preservation of the salt and, and the addition, the impact that the salt made. Then he could point up to the highest place where there were a, a merger of cities. And he said, it's like cities built on a hill. And he used that to talk about how you and I, we are salt and we are light. Salt as in we make things better. Light as in we make things brighter. Salt and light both are undeniable when they are present, just like the salt you see he's speaking to these people. It's an illustrated sermon. Just like the, the city that cannot be ignored, that cannot be denied because of its place. You as the salt and the light are that level of influence and with your proximity and with the power of God on you, you make the difference like that of salt and light. The message paraphrase says it like this, let me tell you who you are and why you are here. There is always a question for those who are searching to figure out, say, why am I here? And Jesus answers it. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. Here's another way he put it. You are here to be light, 
bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm gonna hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you here, there on a hilltop, and on a light stand, shine, keep. Now Jesus is preaching, keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. If Jesus stood here today, he would say there are souls that still need saving and you are the salt, you are the light. Go, make it better, make it brighter, point them to me. He would challenge us and remind us that each of the four gospels ends with a summons called a commissioning, making it abundantly clear that we have a purpose and we are not to drift. We are not to become confused on our purpose of why we are here. Let's talk about how to do it today. I wanna to talk about connecting. The way I'm salt and light is if I am willing and intentionally connecting with people. Why would I connect with people? Because people are valuable. People matter, yeah, that's right, come on. People matter, people are valuable. And I care about them because they matter. And because I care, I look for ways to connect. You see, I can't call for people to understand the need of aligning with Jesus and the correction that will happen as Jesus starts transforming them. I can't get into the correction conversation unless I've started with connection letting people know that, that, that I'm here for them. Not if they believe like me, not if they see life like I do. Jesus gave us the example that he was here like a doctor for people that were sick. And so we are going after it to intentionally connect and then influencing. This is where I look for ways to serve. I look for ways to help somebody. I look for ways to add value. When we sent people to Colorado City just a week ago, they did a project in the director's home that's serving all of these people going through rehabilitation. They made life brighter and better for so many people. When you serve through the various ministries of the church, it is an opportunity. It is a way of bringing influence to people. Think about a waterfall today. I love them. They're awesome to me, they're majestic, they're refreshing, they're powerful. And as you look at this waterfall, I, I just want you to think about the impact of Jesus. Jesus is a life giver. Jesus is refreshing the power and the presence of Jesus. It, it was undeniable, it couldn't be ignored. And so I wanna ask you today, are you a refreshing presence and can we make sure that we are a refreshing presence in somebody's life? Can we bring that vitality? Can we live out the joy of Jesus, the, the love of Christ, and be a life-giving presence in somebody's life? You know, there are people who literally travel places to look at waterfalls. Nobody, nobody has ever told me, hey, we're going on a trip, where are you going? We're just going on a trip looking at the great drains of the world. <laughs> Nobody goes, look at that. Now look at that drain. Let's get a picture. Nobody, nobody. I don't want to be a drain on people. I want to be a life-giving, vital presence in their life. Let's be the salt. Let's be the light. Come on, if you believe it, let's do this together. Now, I've got to take you into a story that I think captures it. Here's the context. Jesus said to those disciples around him, I'm going to Samaria. They didn't really want to go. And that's a message in and of itself. But he goes to Samaria and he positions himself at a well. And this lady, this woman of Samaria comes to get water. He connects with her and he influences her. 
until her story was that she had had five failed marriages and she's living with a guy that she wasn't married to. Her life is, was just broken. And you can see that she kept turning to people to try to meet this void that was in her life. And Jesus became this life-giving presence. And he said, as you are here drawing water, you will be back because this water can't quench your thirst long-term. But if you will take of this water, this water of life that I give, spiritually, you'll never thirst again. You won't have to look around you for someone to meet the need, the, the, the vacuum that is in your soul, because I am that one who meets the need of the human heart and the human soul. And she was so revolutionized, the Bible says, that she took off to the town nearby. It wasn't far. And she's telling everybody, you got to come see him. See, fi found people, find people. You've got to come see him. You got to come see the man. He told me everything about me. He has, you've got to come see him. Meanwhile, before she gets back with all of these people, the disciples, once they got to Samaria, they went away to get some food. And when they return, here's the conversation in verse 31. Meanwhile, they get back and his disciples urged him, Rabbi, you need to eat something. But he said to them, I love Jesus. I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And the disciples said to each other, you mean we went to get food and somebody dashed him food? Somebody brought him food? And Jesus is just like, no, 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 no. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest, and it was in that culture a saying used when you were going to put something off. We're going to procrastinate something. You can say, hey, it, it's four months and then harvest, as if to say, no need for urgency, no need for intentionality. Now notice this next statement. I tell you, open your eyes. Hear the Spirit saying that to us today. Open your eyes in a fresh way. Open your eyes if you've lost focus about what really matters. These disciples weren't even in the real conversation. Now, how many of you been raised in church? You've been in church for a while. Let me see your hand. You know we've got to be careful because if we're not, we'll become internally focused and forget that there are people who are needy and broken and the Lord has put us here to reach them and we are the plan by which they get introduced to Jesus. Oh God, open our eyes. I love this song, what do you see? What do you see? Do you see a cross where he died in our place? Do you see an empty grave where he rose and broke the power of sin and Satan and death and the grave? What do you see? Do you see that we are sitting on the verge of an opportunity to reach people? Oh, let's, let's say, Jesus, open our eyes. Open our eyes. What would happen if our eyes are freshly opened? Well, we would hold key conversations. Jesus went into Samaria and he held a key conversation. He was intentional. And so as you set your heart, you will say things in such a way as to set up the next statement and the next statement and being led of the Spirit because you so love Jesus and want other people to know Him, your mind will be inspired by the Holy Spirit because the role of the Spirit is to empower those words of witness, witness of what Jesus has done for you so that people can get a glimpse of what can happen for them, a key conversation. Can I ask you, can I ask us, could we all have some key conversations this week? Look at all these people in this room. Imagine if we return next Sunday and we've all been intentional, we've had these key conversations. That's when our dispersing becomes as powerful as our gathering. 
that's when church starts happening mm, between Sundays. And I'm not saying you'll walk in here and say all these people got, got saved. We're not the Savior. We're just the witnesses. And we get so energized when we're on the adventure of letting our light shine and salting a conversation with what Jesus has done for us and telling our story of how he found us and it leads to how he can find them. You see, most of the preaching, and I get it because I'm pastor and preacher, we come here because it's, it's much easier to speak to a felt need. And, and I speak directly to you for you. Today, for most in the room, uh, you're already saved. So I'm talking about people that are out there. They're not in here. But wouldn't it be awesome if we could get as fired up about going out and sharing this gospel with people as we do about the message that's direct to us? Read the New Testament, so much of it. He is edifying the church. It's the church being built up in its faith, in her faith. The church being just empowered. It, it, it's all a blessing to keep you growing as a disciple. But not that we would become like a reservoir, but we are a conduit. We are a catalyst so that all the good stuff that's happening in us will flow through us as an ongoing message of salt and light. The devil never stops communicating. The devil goes at it 24 seven, making people compare themselves and smashing people with insecurity and bringing people into the despair of depression. While we hold the message of love, life, hope, freedom, victory, come on. Let's go public. Let's go public. Let's tell some people about the love and the grace and the power of Jesus. Oh, if we could just ask the Holy Spirit to give us a boldness, not to be overbearing, but the kind of clarity that lets you know that every person you talk to, they have an internal indicator that God has put there that makes them search for something to fill that void. You're not talking to them about something that they're unaware of. I'm talking about when you say, how's it going? They can recognize need in their life. And the reason they know that need is there because God created us in such a way as to go on a search for that which would meet the need of the human experience. And he is that person, Paul said, he's written eternity on our hearts. Not those who get saved, upon everybody's heart. He's written eternity. That's why some people just look at a sunrise and say, there must be a God. Some people look at the starry sky and say, behind this incredible creation, there must be a creator. What is that? That's that internal indicator that God has put in the soul of humanity. And in steps, not an arrogant church, not an overbearing church, but a loving church who puts some salt on that. Come on, who puts some light on that. And we are the carriers of this transformational power. See, we just testified that the old is gone and the new has come. That Jesus found us and he's brought that change and is bringing that change in us. And you know how it is. You go see a great movie. Matter of fact, a few months ago when Spider-Man came out, person after person after person was saying, have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? We didn't conduct a seminar that says, here's how you go tell people about Spider-Man. You just loved it, and because you loved it, you found it natural to just talk about it. Because you talked about what you got excited about. I need some people that'll get excited about Jesus. Woo! Peter and John, when they're standing before what would be like a city council because they've been doing ministry in Jesus' name. They said, you've got to shut this down, quit talking and quit preaching in Jesus' name. And here's their response. We can't help it. Hear that, we can't help it. 
And what they're trying to say is, he's revolutionized our lives. He came along and found us. Peter knew the change that he brought in his life. John knew the change. John was known as a son of thunder, modern day. The dude was in a gang. Like he was rough. He was mean. I mean, thunderous, like he, he knew rage, but Jesus came along and put him back together. Jesus came along and did what nothing else was able to do. And so when they're there in front of this, this council, they said, look, we're not trying to be defiant. We're just telling you that if we talk very long, Jesus and who he is and what he's done, it's going to come out. It's just because how if I get a cure for all of cancer, do you think I'm going to keep that to myself? I'm going to shout it. I'm going to deliver it. I'm going to witness of it. You better not talk. Are you kidding? I'm going to, I can't help it. We have the answer to eternal life. We have the news that's good. Help me today. We have the news that's great. Get a fresh evangelistic fire stirred up in your heart until you're like, Pastor, quit preaching. Let us go home. We, let us get back in our neighborhoods so that we can be the light and be the salt. Hallelujah. Key conversations. Here's the next one. A pull up to a table of transformation. Jesus there at that location had that connection and that influence and that conversation and it became transforming. Jesus coming into one city said he saw the crowds. He saw, he saw the crowds. What are you seeing today? He saw the crowds and had compassion. And as he's walking along, he sees this guy who had become interested and he had climbed a tree so that he could get a vantage point. You know who I'm talking about? Zacchaeus. And he said, hey, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the most notorious sinner of his community. A tax collector that in that day not only collected taxes on behalf of Rome, but then extorted and collected so much for their own personal gain. So the worst of the worst of the worst. And Jesus says, we're going to your house. And they sat at his table. And we don't know all that Jesus said. All we know is that when they got up from the table, that Zacchaeus was never the same again. And the reason we know that is because he started paying people back. On Wednesday night, Brotherhood, these guys are gathering around tables and Pastor Justin is here and Will is here. They'll tell you there's transformation happening around those tables. Am I right? Like it's happening. These key conversations are leading to transformation. The ladies are gathering both campuses. Am I right about it? Transformation. Like I just wish I could tell you just how deep the work of Jesus is. It's like it, these things are so sensitive. I'm just telling you transformation is happening. And I'm not saying that's the only place. This could be you taking someone to lunch, you taking someone to dinner, inviting somebody to your house. You see, you value people, so now you're going to influence people. How? Let's set up a key conversation. Let's come around a table. Let's look in people's eyes and, and move to the story of grace. Because people will look, with you, look at you and you'll start picking this up. They're like, hey, I, I think you actually care about me. Number two, not only do you care about me, it, it would seem that you are here to help me and that you want to help me. And then thirdly, not only are you here, to, it seems that I can trust you. So you are helpful because you're caring and you are what? Trustworthy. See, some people, they hurt so much that they have to change. Like they've hit the wall. They're, they're as broken as they can be. And they hurt so badly that they have to change. The key is, will a Christian step in right then? Or will the enemy have a voice that steps in that offers something that just makes it worse? 
Some people get inspired enough that they change. Think about that. Like in an atmosphere like this, we're talking about Jesus and there's an inspiration that just makes you feel like, hey, their change is possible. It's where people learn enough that they're actually able to change. You mean there is an answer? Like I've tried all that. You mean there's an answer? Yes. Yeah, and, and out of what you say, they learn enough that they are able to change because they submit, they call on, they cry out to Jesus as you did. Well, I know that we're in a 14-day period that is about the easiest time of the entire year to be about this. So I'm gonna give you one third step and would you give a life-changing invitation? And we give this in two ways. One, just in that key conversation, ultimately take it to praying with someone to accept Jesus. Has it been a while since that's happened through your life? When we talk about revival, let me just get real honest with you. Let's have a, like a, a church chat. If a church doesn't stay evangelistic, where we're telling people about Jesus and we're coming in going, hey, this is my friend, they just got saved. Hey, this is my friend, they just got saved. And the house is constantly being filled with new believers. Then we keep having to whip it up to keep the saints jazzed. And I'm not being critical of you. I'm talking about it. that's we're just prone to if it becomes just about us, then we have to keep finding ways to speak to us. And you know, uh, some people don't go see Spider-Man because they're done with sequels. And, and the church just becomes a sequel of past. Like we know that we've experienced that, and maybe it can hit you a little, a little uniquely. If we sing the essence of the songs, though they are different, the messages are always going to... What is the real life? What is the real life? It's new life. It's looking around seeing new converts. Babies being born into the faith. Come on, somebody. So how, if it's been a minute since you've expressed your faith to Jesus, if it's been a minute since you have been in a key conversation. How about this week? See, this week, don't let this pass over you as if someone else will do it. Say, I'm into this. I am going to do this. And this life-changing invitation is not just you interacting and leading them to a sinner's prayer. Invite them to church. Invite them to church. Here's a statistic I want you to see. 82% of people leading up to an Easter service who don't go to church are likely to say yes if invited. That means if you ask 10 people, eight of them are going to say yes. This is prime time. This is this opportunity to not just let it pass by Look at these seats. Imagine all of these seats being filled with somebody who needs to know more, who needs to know that there's an answer in Jesus. And, and we have to be careful, don't we, living in this community? Can I tell you a story that 13 years ago when we moved here, just a few weeks into it, our son was sick, and it was just like something that over-the-counter medicine wasn't helping, so we took him to the doctor. And the doctor gave a prescription right before we left. The doctor said, hey, can I pray for your son? First time in our life that a doctor ever said, hey, do you mind if I pray? We are like, absolutely. We go to the drugstore to get the prescription filled. The pharmacist hands me the prescription, says, look, I'm not trying to pry. I just want you to know I'm a praying man, and I'm going to be praying for your son. I walk out. I said, Kelly, <laughs> this, this is amazing. This is just amazing. Let's understand, we live in the, we're, we're right in the buckle of the Bible belt. And the devil would love for you and I to think everybody's okay. Everybody's saved. 
when there are hundreds, even thousands of people that have never believed in their heart and confess with their mouth. And as the worship team comes back, I want you to know that means they're lost. And lost means lost. I'm going to take a few more minutes, and this needs to be a few minutes where I need you unless it's an absolute emergency. I need it to get real still in this house. The worship team will be coming around, but there's nothing more important than what we're going to do in the next few minutes. So if, if it's an emergency, exit. If not, stay with me and stay so attentive. When I was a sophomore in college, it was a small college, about 600 students, and so the way the, the campus was designed, there were classrooms, chapel, dormitories, cafeteria, and so there was just this open area, like a, just a courtyard there in the middle, and it's where you know, people just hang out, a gathering place. And a message went through every dorm, through every classroom, through the cafeteria that there was an emergency and everybody needed to get to the courtyard. When we assembled there, there were policemen and they made this announcement. There's a little girl that's been lost and she's been lost so long it's getting desperate. And we want to ask if you'd be willing to help us. We believe she's lost in this vicinity. And we want to ask, will you help us go and search for this lost girl? No one said, I don't have time. No one said, uh, I don't know how to do that. Everybody said, you just point the way. And so we were organized into teams to go and search. And one of the teams, they found that little girl. And she, this lost girl, was restored safely to her family. And the next day, a professor looked at us. He said, I'm very proud of the way you all responded to that need. But he says, as ministers in the training to be leaders of churches, I hope that you never forget that loss means lost. The reason that you adjusted your schedule, the reason that nothing else matters because you believed that she was lost and there were consequences to being lost. And so it became urgent and you became intentional and you were faithful until she was found. And she says, as you lead churches, you need to raise urgency about people who are lost. You need to call for people to be intentional to go and rescue the lost and to be faithful until those who are lost are found. Because loss means loss. Jesus, he gave three stories one right after the other, and each story contained about something or someone who was lost. And it, that which was lost was so valuable that it demanded and called for an all-out search. And once, once that which was lost was found, it called for a celebration. And of course, he was giving us the picture that what really matters is that we understand we are those that will go searching for those who are lost. Would you stand with me, everybody? There are people out there, they're searching. Like the song says, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Treasures that fade, nothing satisfies, but Jesus comes along. How will Jesus come along? How will Jesus cross their path? He does it through you and through me. Through you and through me. I want you to close your eyes in the presence of God. Lord, today we give ourselves to a key conversation. We give ourselves to sitting at a table with somebody. Maybe it's this Wednesday. Maybe it's on another day in another setting. But God, we will sit at a table and just allow grace to fashion the conversation, to lead the conversation. God, we will invite somebody to come into a relationship with you. In addition, Lord, we'll invite somebody to come to church, to experience your presence 
in the presence of people who have been transformed by you and allow you to take that experience and begin to knock on the door of their heart. And God, over the next 14 days and beyond, we are going to be urgent, intentional, and faithful. And God, we will celebrate as people are converted from sin to salvation, as people are brought out of darkness into a light and a life in a relationship with you. We commit ourselves. We're not going to do this Easter just thinking about ourselves. God, we're going to share this with someone. We commit. Now with every head bowed, if today you'd say, I'm one of those people that's never believed in my heart, but I realize Jesus is the one I'm looking for. Jesus is the one who can change me. And oh, how I need that change. So I'm asking you, don't leave here the way you came. Jesus is the answer. This is a sacred moment. The presence of his grace is like a person knocking at a door. It's the door of your heart. Will you say today, I wanna open the door of my heart to the saving grace and a relationship with Jesus. If that is you, would you just lift your hand right now as quickly as you can. Lift it up. I see your hand. Thank you. Someone else? Just lift your hand. I'll see it. Thank you. I see your hand. Praise God. Christians pray. There are two people that are being found by the grace of God today. Anybody else? Say, here's my hand. Get it up as high as you can. I'll see it. And we're going to pray. Say, I need to accept Christ. The greatest miracle this side of heaven is about to happen for people. There is no greater miracle than what is about to be experienced. For those of you that lifted your hands, here's what I want to do. I'm going to lead in a prayer, and you just repeat this. It's not that you don't know what to say. It's just as an encouragement to you, a way of helping you in this expression of your surrender to Jesus. And what we'll do is every Christian is going to join in in repeating this prayer as a loving, supportive way to say, we are with you. We are with you in this life-changing choice that you are making today. Thank you, God. So would you repeat this after me? Jesus, I open my heart to you. I know that you died in my place so that my sins could be forgiven. You rose again getting victory over sin and shame so that I could accept that grace and the guilt could be broken off of my life. I submit my life to you. Thank you for what you have done for me. Thank you for forgiving me today and leading me forward from this day on. Thank you, Jesus, for this setting with these people where my life is being changed for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.